Hello, and welcome to Lecture 14, where we're going to cover the beginning of Chapter 6, which is all about the forces of uniform and non-uniform um, circular motion. And these are Section 6.1 and 6, or 2, 6.3, okay? So we've seen circular motion before. We saw it in Lecture 8, but we didn't talk about the forces before. We just talked about the accelerations. I included a lot of examples here, so we could really illustrate a lot of ideas, some of them pretty big examples. I'll try not to take forever on them, but I wanted you to see a lot of practice and a lot of problem-solving techniques. Okay, so let's get to it. Okay, so we just have a couple of key terms. All right, so first of all, we have um, centripetal force. This is the force that creates circular motion. It's the force that creates centripetal acceleration, right? A term we've seen before tension, friction, gravity, normal force, and their components and combinations thereof can all be centripetal forces. There's no centripetal force on its own. It has to be created by some other force. It always points towards the center of the circle. By definition, centripetal means center seeking. All right. On the other hand, there's something called centrifugal force. Maybe you've heard of it. Well, it's not a real force. It is a fictitious or apparent force that objects in circular motion seem to experience. What do I mean by that? Well, it's not a real force because it is not measured in an inertial reference frame. We've talked about that. Newton's three laws only apply to inertial reference frames. Inertial reference frames are those reference frames that are not accelerating. In other words, reference frames that are moving at constant velocity or at rest. Any reference frame that is accelerating is a non-inertial reference frame and Newton's laws cannot be applied because if they are, then you end up with fictitious forces. And if you don't know they're fictitious, that's misleading. Okay, so the apparent existence of the centrifugal force is just a consequence of Newton's first law. It's just inertia. It's just the idea that objects want to stay in motion. All right. And so that apparent motion or that apparent force that wants to throw you out of a curve you know, that force that where you feel like if you're turning towards the left, you feel a force like that wants to throw you to a right. That's not a real force. That's just you wanting to continue straight. All right. And that's why you appear to be thrown to the right if you're turning towards the left. It's no different than slamming on the brakes and flying forward. That's also caused by your inertia. Okay. So the centrifugal force is not a real force. Okay. Let's look at our equations. Again, these should be very similar to lecture eight to the equations on uniform circular motion when we didn't talk about forces. All right, so we have the centripetal force, subscript, subscript, subscript C for centripetal. It can also be called the radial force because it's in the radial direction. You know, it's kind of the axis towards the center. Okay, all right. It is equal to mass times the centripetal acceleration. That's this is just Newton's, Newton's second law, F equals MA. All right, centripetal acceleration, we already know it has the form of V squared over R. All right, m is mass, v is velocity, and radius is the radius of the circular path, okay? All right, and we've seen this, these ideas before. This is t for period, all right? And then f is the frequency of the circular revolutions per second. t is the period of the circular motion, okay? v is obviously the velocity. So the velocity for uniform circular motion is 2 pi r over t. For non-uniform circular motion, you can still use this as long as you realize that your t is just the instantaneous period. It'd be, it's like the period at that moment in time, okay? And then as far as the vector nature of the total force going through circular motion, especially non-uniform circular motion, well, there would be a centripetal acceler um, component along the radial axis, the radial, radial unit vector, and then a tangential component, potentially a tangential force, times on the tangential axis. What that looks like in the picture here is, you know, here we have the radius of a circle, here's our circle, and then we have this coordinate system with the radial direction, let me zoom in a bit, the radial direction and the tangential direction, and so we could split up the forces, the centripetal force along the radial direction, the tangential force along the tangential direction, and then the net force just being the vector sum of those two forces. And this is a good example of a non-uniform circular motion because our velocity vector is growing, and we can see as the velocity vector grows, the centripetal Ve uh, force vector component grows, and then the angle becomes steeper and steeper, becomes more, more towards the radial direction, the net force that is. Okay, so kind of nice illustration here. Okay, let's move on to those examples. All right, so four types. Problems that involve uniform circular motion where all the force vectors are in the plane of the loop, or the plane of the circular path. Okay, so kind of the strictly 2D, simpler, simple to deal with, relatively simple. We got type two, fairly complex problems that involve uniform circular motion where the force vectors can be tilted to the plane of the loop. So now we have to deal with components. 
Type 3, problems that involve non-uniform circular motion where all the force vectors are on the plane of the loop. So type 3 is like type 1, except it's non-uniform. And then finally type 4, non-uniform and tilted. Okay? So example 1. All right? So I'm try to move some, through some of these quickly. Um, in this case, it's a 2D case. Someone's swinging something. We're given the mass of the object. Okay? We're given the radius. And then we're asked to find the tension. Okay? So first we want to find the velocity of the ball because we weren't given the velocity, notice, but we were given um, something about the rotation. It's the, um, a constant rate of rotation. Yeah, four complete rotations per second. So we're given the frequency. So based on the frequency, we can just take, we can find two pi r over the period. The period has to be a quarter of a second if you're making four revolutions per second. And that gives us a velocity of 19.4 meters per second. And since this is a planar type problem, we're actually going to, assuming that the string is rigid. If the string wasn't rigid, it'd be it'd have to be some tilt to it, which means that, you know, kind of if you imagine like this, it'd have to be tilted down, which then there would be a gravitational force and a tension force, and we'd have to deal with components. And we actually have a problem like that. So this is a simpler problem. You could also think of it maybe as that the ball is restricted to spinning on a table or something. But regardless, it's entirely 2D. And so then it's simply a matter of saying that the net the net forces in the radial direction is just the centripetal force equal to MAC. And that centripetal force is, has to be the tension force. Here it's labeled as FC, but it, it is the tension. So then we, if we solve for the tension, it's just M times centripetal acceleration, or M times V squared over R. Plug in our numbers, and we get 657 newtons. Quite a bit of force, actually, but we are spinning it quite quickly. Okay? All right. Concept question. Just thinking about how tension changes as a function of radius and mass. Here we're holding the velocity constant in four cases. All right, so let's consider case one. I'll call that T1. All right, this is for tension, not period, by the way, because that's we're comparing tensions. So T1, we got mass and R, okay? So that's just the you know, value, kind of consider that like a placeholder and compare the other three to it. So then T2, the only difference is that the radius is twice as long, which means that T2, the tension is one half as much. So increasing the length decreases the tension. Okay, well here we're doing double the mass, which means that T3 is actually twice the, um, the original tension, T1. Well, what about number four? Well, here we double both of them, but then the effect cancels out. So we have a two and a two, which means it's just equal to the tension in case one. So if we order them from least or largest to smallest, then we have three, one and four are tied, and our smallest is two, okay? So just a quick idea about how the tensions are related. Okay, so another just strictly 2D problem, all the motion in the plane of the loop, but this one we're going up against gravity, we're spinning something upside down, and the idea is that we need to spin it just fast enough for some forces to zero out. Um, this, this is an idea we're going to see more when we talk about energy and loop-de-loops and, and maybe pendulum swinging all the way up over the top or a swing swinging all the way over the top or you know, a bucket of water like this. Okay? But, but we, here we're not talking about the energy, but still we're laying the groundwork for further discussion. So a bucket of water is swung in a vertical circle, so the bucket travels upside down, but the water does not spill. In this case, the string has a known length, 1.6. The bucket, we're given its mass, and the water, we're given its mass as well. So we would have the total mass if we sum the two, right? The speed of the bucket at the top is constant, okay? So um, with, you know, it's uniform circular motion, at least at the top, so that's what we care about. What is the minimum speed the bucket must be traveling at the top of the swing um, in order for the water not to spill? Okay, interesting question. How will we deal with that? Well, here's our force diagram, okay? So here we, we, can, we consider that if the bucket is completely vertical at the top of the swing, there's gravity pointing down for sure, and then we'll propose that there's some normal force, okay? So here we'd set up our sum of forces in the y direction, positive y downwards, or, or otherwise known as the radial direction, because it'd be towards the center, right? Okay, and that'd have to be equal to MAC, right? Also pointing downwards, because centripetal acceleration points towards the center, okay? And just then we'll elaborate on that. G, our, the gravitational force is mg, and A is just v squared over L, because L is our radius. Okay, but here's the thing. If we want to find V minimum in order to get all the way through the top with the water out with, with the water not spilling, then we actually want the normal force to be zero. That would be the case for the minimum velocity. Because any any velocity greater than that would create a normal force. So if we want just enough normal force for it not to spill, then that would be our V min. The way I think about it is that when you spin it just fast enough for it not to spin not to spill, thus creating a normal force of zero. The, you mean, what that means is that the gravitational force is sufficient entirely to be the centripetal force. You don't need any excess force to be the, the, um, the centripetal force, okay? 
And that's it. You're just if if the gravity exactly equals the centripetal force, that's your minimum velocity case. All right. So then we find out that minimum velocity is just the root root L G. All right, or root root L R. Right. However you want to think about it. Um, excuse me, R G, because you know you think of L as being R in many cases, the radius. Plug in our numbers, and it turns out to be 3.96 meters per second for these particular numbers. Okay. And now part B. All right. What is the tension in the string when this minimum speed is achieved? Well, it should be zero. Right. So because we're spinning it just fast enough for there to be no normal force, but there's nothing special about the normal force versus the tension force. Because in other words, at the very top, it's momentarily weightless. It's momentarily weightless because the gravity, again, is entirely just doing the job of centripetal force. I guess even another way of thinking about it is if you're spinning it just fast enough for it to be momentarily weightless at the top, what's happening then is it, that the gravity isn't accelerating it downwards. The gravity is just turning it. Right, because acceleration can turn things. In this case, the acceleration is is spinning just enough gravitational acceleration, just enough acceleration to turn it in a circle at that moment in time. Okay, so the tension should be zero. But let's prove it. Okay, so here is our diagram focused on the total mass of the bucket and water, gravity and tension. Okay, now we, you know we hope to show that zero, but we're proposing that it could exist. All right, let's plug in our values. Okay, so we just have mass times gravity, F T. Right, just sitting there that will solve for it. And then mass total, because this is water plus bucket. All right, and then we got our centripetal acceleration. All right, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to plug in the symbolic form for the minimum velocity, because we know it has to be equal to root LG. When we do that, the square root um, goes away, because we're squaring it. And then the L is going to go away. And then we're just going to be left with the tension force is just M times G minus M times G. Well, there we go. Okay, we're able to show that it has to be zero. The tension force has to be zero. If the normal force is zero, so must be the tension for that case of minimum velocity when it's momentarily weightless at the top of the swing, okay? The circular swing, swing, okay? All right, part C. All right, in this case, what's going on? So what constant speed does the bucket need at the top of the swing in order for the normal force acting on the water of the bucket to be 20 newtons? Oh, okay. So now we're, we're swinging it more than fast enough. We're swinging it fast enough that the water is actually pushing into the top, okay? So that means we definitely expect a value bigger than 3.96. All right, so let's plug it in. All right, so we're just gonna go through and we're gonna solve for V, all right? And so I just, you know, nothing, not so much cancels out this time. I'm gonna plug in the actual value for um, F sub N for the normal force. All right, all our other values we know. N is be 4.87, a reasonable number because it's larger than 3.996. Because the faster you swing it, the bigger the normal force and also the bigger the tension. The tension wouldn't be equal Right in terms of the newtons, because it'd be a different different mass that's being supported, but it's the same idea. It would go up proportionally. Okay, all right. Now it's considered kind of another weightless case, but this kind of, this time a driver driving over a hill. So a stunt car is going to the top of a hill that has a circular curvature of the radius of 102 meters. What is the maximum speed they can go over the hill and not become airborne? So we want them not to lose their normal force. We want them just to you know basically be weightless, but not not like actually start accelerating up into the air. All right, so here's the case. This is the free body diagram, all right? Just gravitational force. We want that to be our only force, all right? So we want the gravitational force to be the entire centripetal force, all right? Maximum speed is reached when F, F is equal to zero, okay? So we just set this up, all right? Set FG equal to MA. In this case, A is the centripetal acceleration. Cancel out our Ms. Solve for V. Ah, hey, look, it's the same form, okay? But here it's V max because it's inverted, right? Because instead of going over the over a loop this way and considering the force at the top, we're going to loop this way and considering the forces, you know, at the, the in like the outside of the loop rather than the inside of the loop. Okay? Still the top, but the other the other side of the loop. Okay? And then plug in our values and we get 31.6 meters per second. Any faster than that, and they would become airborne at the top. This there they'd still be kind of weightless at the top here because the normal force is zero after all, but they wouldn't actually catch air at this speed. Okay? And any speed less than this, and there would be a normal force. It'd be small, right, relative to them being at rest, but, you know, it would be there, be non-zero. Okay, so good, hopefully simple cases, but illustrating the idea about how forces, centripetal forces, and gravity interact. Okay? All right, so I've got one more here. This one is going to be a type of problem we're going to see a lot of variations on, and it's a car going through a turn. Not a, not a car going over a... Um, a hill, like in the, in the last example, but a turn that you could see from the top, like a bird's eye view of a turn. Basically this, okay, this is looking down on a car going through a circular turn. I, mean, I have a lot of examples like this. I like this type of example. Even the, the uh, challenge problem of the week is, is a variation on this type of problem. 
Okay, so in this case, we have the simplest case. It's an unbanked curve. Okay, we'll talk about banking in a second. Essentially, the road is totally flat, and friction here is going to be playing the job of playing the role, doing the job of centripetal force. Right? So I said lots of different forces can be a centripetal force. In this case, it's going to be entirely friction. Okay, so our F net in the radial direction is the force of friction, which is equal to MA. A, of course, in this case, being V squared over R. All right, so then we're going to look at the sum of forces in the Y direction, which is kind of trivial. This is just going to tell us that Fn equals Fg. In other words, Fn just equals Mg. Okay, that's all we need it for. Okay, and then we're just going to carry on and solve for the friction coefficient, which is going to be V squared over RG. RG, that is. All right, plug in the velocity that we have, the radius of the curve, and gravity, and we end up needing a friction coefficient of 0.48. Kind of a reasonable, high, a high-end friction coefficient, but it means it's doable. The car can make it through this turn at this particular speed and not slip out of the turn as long as there's distance friction between their, their cars, or their um, car's tires in the road, okay? Now, let's consider a case where there's something helping, where friction doesn't have to do all of the holding, okay? So in this case, we imagine a bank turn. What does that look like? Well, it looks the same from the top. There's no, no difference between the two. But from the side, there's a banking angle, right? And this is you know, a realistic turn, right? especially steep turns tend to be banked because that way, they, it's not just friction that is supplying the centripetal force, but a component of the normal force, what I'm calling the X component of the normal force is also contributing. So now we have, um, actually in this case, excuse me, in this case, there's no friction. So I'm kind of, we're setting it up incrementally. And also this is case two because there are, there's tilts and we have to consider components. So it's a little bit more complicated problem, but we're not, we haven't introduced friction into, into the situation yet. We're just, we're doing one at a time. This one, the example four was all friction. Example five is all banking. Okay. So this is like totally icy road and the banking is, is, is doing it completely. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to solve for the banking angle that would allow that to work for, again, for this particular speed and that particular radius turn, okay? Which are the same numbers, interestingly, as the example, example above, okay? So, all right, so this, this component of the normal forces is our entire centripetal force, all right? Notice also that I did something that we haven't done in previous chapters. I chose a coordinate system that's not tilted. You know, like, it's usually a really good idea to choose a co coordinate system that's tilted with the, um, the incline so you can save yourself work on components. In that case, your normal force wouldn't have components. But since we have an acceleration that is parallel to X, if we did choose a tilted coordinate system, we'd have to have components on A, which is fine, but it's extra algebra. So it's actually easier to do it this way. So the way I think about it is if you can have one of your sum of force equations equal zero, then you should, because inherently then you're gonna be making it easier for you to solve the problem. So like, look here, right? My, by choosing the coordinate system that I did, I, I had one of my sum of forces equal zero, okay? So let's just do the, um, kind of do our simplification here. So if you look at our sum of forces in X, this is just the X component of the normal force equal to mass times, mass times the centripetal acceleration. I'm going to expand out the X component of the normal force is Fn sine theta, theta being the banking angle. Okay, and then I'm going to um, notice that for my sum of forces in the Y direction that Fn is just equal to mg over cosine theta. Okay, and that was again just solving for Fn. I'm then, then going to substitute that in. Okay, and when I substitute it in and cancel out my m's and isolate my theta, because I have a sine theta over cosine theta, which becomes a tangent theta, okay, right here. Then I do the inverse to get my theta by itself. So it's just tangent inverse of v squared over rg. Notice it's the same v squared over rg that showed up for the, the friction coefficient. The only difference is that this time, that ratio, right, a, a dimensionless ratio, was just the value itself. Here, our dimensionless ratio, meter squared over second squared, both in the numerator and the denominator, well, it's going to be inside of the inverse trig function, you know? So it's kind of interesting, okay? And when we do that and plug in all our numbers, we get 25.6 degrees. It's actually really steep for a banking angle, right? It's like a racetrack. But of course, it, it probably has to be really steep because we're trying to, you know, make this turn, a fairly tight turn at a fairly great speed without any friction at all, right? Doing it on like an oil, oil slick road. So hence the really steep banking angle, okay? All right, so we'll get back to uh, combining friction and banking angles in just a moment. Let's do another type of 2D problem, a more realistic version of example one. Okay, so in this case, we're spinning something, we're spinning a string, and we're spinning it at a certain speed, but we have to acknowledge that as we do that, it doesn't spin com exactly horizontally, right? The string actually hangs relative to gravity, right? It's like a tetherball, okay? You know, like the, the game you play on playgrounds as a child, okay? 
So we're given the mass here, all right, 19.9 kilograms. Um, we're given the length of the cord, 2.17 meters, and it's spun at a rate of 30 RPM, and we're actually going to solve for the angle. Okay, we could solve for any number of things. We could, we could have been given the angle and solved for L, or given the angle and solved for V, you know, so, but in this case, I'm actually asking you to solve for the angle based on that information. What must be the angle for this particular case? And we, we're given V, but we have to work for it, because we can find V based on um, the RPM, okay? But I'm going to kind of actually substitute it in and never find it explicitly, but rather just kind of like follow the variables. Um, the other thing I'll, I'll say is that sometimes it's called a conical pendulum. I think that's a term your book uses as well. Okay, so let's just set up our free body diagram. We have a coordinate system, X and Y, all right? Um, and then we see the tension force, of course, is along the string, and gravity points straight down in the negative Y direction. All right, so looks at, let's look at our sum of forces in X and Y. Okay, so in the X direction, there's this component of the um, tension force. That's it, right, because gravity doesn't have an X component. And then that's going to be equal to M times V squared over R. Ah, but we don't know R exactly, right? Because R is this, and R isn't equal to L, but R is equal to a component of L. It's equal to L sine theta, right? Because you can see it's just, it's just this right triangle, okay? All right, and then we look at our sum of forces in Y. Hey, equal to zero. See, I'm using that same logic. Make my life easier, right? And then let's do the algebra, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and find V based on the information I was given on the frequency, okay? So then we have 2 pi times L sine theta, because I know that's equal to R, times the frequency F, okay? All right, we'll uh, deal with that in just a minute. We'll substitute it back in, that is. And then I'm going to use um, my sum of forces in the x direction, uh, sorry, the y direction, to solve for the tension force, just express it, express it at m mg over cosine theta. The same thing we did up here for the normal force, quite similar, right? All right it's good to see similarities. Okay, then I'm going to substitute that in, basically everything back into our, my sum of forces in the x direction. So the tension force just becomes mg over cosine theta. I have a sine theta over here. On the right-hand side of the equation, I have my m. My v squared becomes this whole thing squared, all right? I kind of uh, distributed the, um, the squared in an interesting way in order to clearly show a bunch of cancellations, which I'll mention in just a second. I know there's a lot of gray lines. And then my denominator on the right-hand side, of course, is l sine theta, because that's just equal to r, right? l sine theta is just r, okay? All right, so what happens? Well, I have a sine theta cancel with that sine theta. Well, I'll do it like this. That sine theta cancels with that one. Meanwhile, the remaining sine theta in the numerator cancels with the one on the left-hand side, so they're completely gone. The m's cancel, all right? And then one of the l's cancel as well, so we're just left with a single l in the numerator on the right-hand side. Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead, clean that up a bit, and all I have left is a cosine. I'm going to cross-multiply, all right? And we get that, and that cosine theta equals g over 4 pi, 4 pi squared f squared over l, or f squared times l, excuse me. All right, check that algebra yourself, make sure that makes sense to you. And then it's just a matter of isolating theta, cosine inverse of all that, plug in my numbers, and there it is, 63 degrees, all right? So pretty steep because it's going pretty fast. And we can see that, the, um, that if you consider this, right, as the frequency becomes smaller and smaller, the angle becomes steeper and st steeper and steeper because the frequency becoming smaller is the same as the speed becoming greater and greater. And it makes sense that the faster this spins, the, big, the closer this angle gets to 90 degrees, and 60, 63 degrees is indeed fairly close to 90, right? Um, also, do notice that the frequency, I converted it to hertz because I have to. So I did 30 over 60 because 30 RPMs divided by 60 seconds um, gives me the number of actual rotations per second because I don't want it per minute, okay? You have to convert over to seconds, base units. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Moving right along. Okay, so this is our first of our rather complex problems of lots, lots of steps to it, Okay. Um, and so let's kind of just jump right into it, but I will describe it. So a racetrack engineer wishes to build a 150 meter radius banked curve with the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the pavement is 0.5 and the desired max allowed speed is 29 uh, meters per second. And they were asked to find the angle. So this is a combination of four and five, okay? So this, this problem is a turn with both friction and baking together, okay? All right, and please excuse my writing on this one. It's a little bit messier because it's an old, I wrote it um, a few years ago and I haven't rewrote re it, um, but it's certainly um, uh, you know, uh, legible. Okay, so here's, uh, here's the diagram, here's the top view, and here's the side view, okay? Kind of like, just like we did um, for the example where it was just banking. Although we have more forces at play here, now we can, well, we can really see, let me zoom in on this a bit, we can really see that we have a component of the normal force and a component of the friction force that are creating the centripetal force, okay? Not the entire friction force, because some of the friction force actually points down in the y direction, but the x component of the friction force and the x component of the normal force create fc, create the centripetal force, 
All right, that's those are those are gonna be the two. That's that's what we care about. Um, also notice that friction points down. That's because we want a max speed. Okay, if we were trying to find a minimum speed, if we were worried about the car slipping down the the, um, the turn, which is less realistic, but it, it can happen. Like if you imagine like the turn is really icy or something, and you're worried about cars actually slipping down it, like if they go too slow, then friction would have to point up because friction always opposes the the, the tendency of motion. Okay. And notice our non-tilted coordinate, um, coordinate system and the, the, the center of the curvature is this way, just you know, as shown here, it's the radius. All right, let's just get right into the sum of forces and how we actually solve this algebraically. All right, so we have our sum of forces in X and Y. Here it's just written um, just in terms of all you know, the, the variables or rather the components, all right? Not really expanding them out, not, not nothing with the theta yet. All right, but here I'm actually gonna write them all in terms of the banking angle theta. All right, for example, fn x becomes fn sine theta. I won't describe every single one of these. I'm also color coding them. So I'm calling one of them the blue equation and the green equation just for um, clarity of following them through the algebra. All right, also by definition, the friction force is mu s fn. Um, and then we can solve for fn from the sum of forces in the y direction. Notice I'm using the summation notation, which I don't usually use. And where sum of forces is just the same as writing f net. This is my more preferred notation, but you know, the, here I'm obviously using the, the, other, the other type. Okay, so then I'm just going to um, go ahead and solve for Fn from the sum of forces in Y. All right, so I've just kind of factored it out. And again, there it is, okay? So that's my green equation because like this is Fn from this equation, okay? So notice I did that, right? I solved for the normal force from one of my two equations. And also notice, again, I chose a coordinate system where one of my equations equals zero, you know, making my life a little bit easier, okay? Now, now look at this next step. It's actually a good strategy of solving these. And there's, there's more than one way to do them, but a lot of ways are gonna be prone to error and you just spending too much time on the algebra, okay? So now I'm gonna rewrite the sum of forces in X and solve for Fn again, because if I solve for Fn from the blue equation, the sum of forces in the X direction, then I'll have, and you know, to have the Fn, then I can set those two Fn's equal to each other, effectively canceling out Fn, right? Okay, all right. So I'm gonna go, this is just me um, isolating Fn from the sum of forces in the next direction. And there we go, okay? So I have two, express, um, two expressions for the normal force, okay? And now, here we go, I set them equal to each other. And that's what we get, okay? The green from Y and the blue from X. Okay, that looks fine. And wait, what was I solving for again? Theta, oh, well, that's not great, right? Because I mean, I got a theta here, a cosine theta, I got a sine theta. How am I actually gonna isolate theta, right? It looks like a dead end. It's not really, okay? Don't get discouraged. Just start trying to, you know, clean it up, see if you, how um, the trig functions work out. So that's all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring all my trig functions to one side and see, you know, what, I, what happens when I find a common denominator. I'm gonna multiply the top and the bottom by cosine theta in order to find a common denominator. And notice what happens. All of a sudden I just start getting tangents. Okay, well look at that. Actually, it looks like I'm gonna be able to get tangent all by itself. And I'm continuing to do that. I move things around. Again, excuse the handwriting, it's a little messy here. And I factor out a tangent all by itself. And there we go. I can finally, since I have a tangent all by itself, I can then actually solve for theta as a tangent inverse of this whole business inside. I won't try to explain the trend based on that. It's there if you look for it, but it's rather complicated. Plug in the numbers for this particular problem, and it's 3.2 degrees. Not nearly as steep, although these weren't the same velocities either but not nearly as steep because friction allowed for the, um, it, you know, it basically you had friction and a component of, well, a component of friction and a component of the normal force both working together in order to hold the car on the track, okay? You didn't need one to do all the work, right? And again, not like actual work, but you know, do all of the holding in place, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. I know it's a lot of algebra, but the, I, you know, hopefully I called attention to the key ideas, the process, so that you can solve it for yourself. Okay, so a couple more. All right, here's a pendulum. So um, pendulums are great, a great example of non-constant acceleration. We'll actually, this is really just the beginning of working with pendulums. We're gonna do a lot, of, a lot with pendulums once we talk about conservation of energy, and then even more of pendulums once we actually talk about rotational motion. You might be like, wait, aren't we talking about rotational motion right now? Well, Okay, we're talking about rotational motion by just focus, focusing on the translational parts, right? We're only talking about velocity and acceleration. It turns out there's a whole nother way of talking about it where we talk about the movement relative to the pivot rather than the movement through X and Y. Um, so it's a, it's a whole nother approach. It's, it's beautiful and amazing, and it's gonna really bring pendulums back up to the forefront of the class, okay? So I, bring, I mentioned that because we're gonna, this is really the beginning of a, a long journey with pendulums. 
but already we can do quite a bit, quite a bit with them, right? So it's nice actually to be already doing that. So a pendulum is, um, is mid swing as shown with a bob, which is just this thing, of mass 3.6 kilograms, mass of string of 84.3 centimeters. That's just like L. All right, um, it's got, it's 13.1 um, centimeters above the ground. I'll draw that in the picture. Essentially, it's 13.1 13 .1 centimeters above its low point. Um, and it's got a speed at this particular moment in time of 4.12 meters per second. And the question in this part A is, what's the tension, okay? So here is the free body diagram. I, you know, it seems like a lot going on, but here's my, um, my coordinate axes, my radial and tangential coordinates. Here's my velocity, which is of course in the tangential direction. Here's gravity with two components, a tangential and radial component, and theta, the same theta as the angle, all right? Here's that height, here's the length of the string. This right here is just L minus H, which we will use um, to find theta, because notice we weren't given theta, we were just given L and H. Um, and the last thing is F net, which won't come up until part B, and same thing for phi, because phi is the angle asked for in part B, okay? So first of all, we're gonna find theta based on this right triangle right here, all right? So cosine theta is L minus H over L. Go ahead and find theta, and it's 32.4 degrees, all right, great. Then we're going to set up a um, sum of forces in the R and T directions. Notice one thing, you know how I said we always wanna have one of our two forces, or one of our two force equations equal to zero? Well, that doesn't work for non-uniform motion. Notice the color of the problems have changed because we're in type three now. Now that we're in non-uniform circular motion, we're always gonna have acceleration. The good thing is that tangential acceleration is usually pretty straightforward. And so we don't have, um, so I wouldn't worry about it too much, but the point is that both of our sums of forces aren't gonna be equal to zero, all right? One is equal to MAT, the other one is equal to MAC, and AC just takes the form of V squared over L, okay? So let's go ahead and then solve for the tension force from um, basically from this equation, from the uh, sum of forces in the radial direction. All right, and there we go. Plug in our numbers, 102 newtons. Notice that we did not need this at all in order to find the tension. The tension was independent of what was happening in the tangential direction. That makes sense because the tension after all is entirely in the radial direction, okay? So it is independent of um, tangential acceleration, okay? All right, 102 newtons, excellent, okay? Again, it was just doing this, plug in numbers, okay? All right, so in part B, I ask, what angle does the net force on the bob make with the radial direction? Okay, well now I'm gonna, I am going to go ahead and actually need um, this acceleration as well, okay? And so then I'm gonna look, I'm gonna say, okay, well, in the radial direction, it's FT minus FGR, it's just this, okay? In the tangential direction, it's just that, okay? So I'm just writing them out symbolically, or at least without the angle yet. Let's then rewrite them showing the angle. All right, well, actually, first of all, let's just go ahead and acknowledge that phi is just gonna be opposite over adjacent. So it's just gonna be those two components, okay? And then let's plug them in. So then FGT, which is this right here, becomes just mg sine theta, of course, because it's just, it's just that component, okay? Sine, because it's opposite, okay? And then the, um, the radial component of net force, okay, not like, a particular force, but net force, is just this here, plug in the numbers, and it's 8.14 .1, degrees, right? So phi is quite a small angle because it's telling us that most of the force is the tension, and this component of the gravitational force is actually quite small, okay? All right, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so two final examples. You have a car um, weighing 1,000 kilograms, so it's traveling around a turn, okay? The car enters the turn with an initial translational velocity, um, the coefficient of static friction between the tires and the pavement is given. The car is accelerating, okay, so that's why it's non-constant, um, with a constant tangential, see, acceleration, which we're given, and the turn is unbanked. After how much time of constant acceleration will the car begin to slip, and through what angle of the turn has the car traveled before beginning to slip? So the reason this is a type three problem is because it is, all the forces are in the plane, um, basically the, uh, the plane of the loop, just like with the, um, with the, the, uh, the pendulum up above in example eight. All the forces were in the plane of the loop, right? We didn't have to deal with, a, you know, we still had components essentially, but really only in part B where I kind of was like making us think about them. But, you know, it was, it was simpler certainly than, you know, thinking about the, the car going around the turn and all, all the components, right? So let's, let's go back to example nine. All right, so here's our bird's eye view of the turn, all right, unbanked turn, so there's no side view necessary. All right, so we use the sum of the radial forces to find V max before slipping, okay? So it's just gonna be um, the only radial force is the force of friction equal to MAC. All right, V, we're calling V max to be clear what it is. All right, so expand our terms there. 
All right, and since it's a level ground, Fn equals, just equals mg. All right, plug things in. All right, solve for our maximum velocity, and it's 23 meters per second. Okay, so that's our, that's our maximum velocity. All right, and then we're going to use kinematics to find time. All right, so now we're going to consider that tangential acceleration we're given, the 7 meters per second squared. All right, so then we're going to find out how much time it takes to reach that maximum velocity, considering we entered the turn at v naught. Okay, so then it takes 1.6 seconds. Okay, so the question was, uh, how much time uh, constant acceleration in the car until the car begins to slip? Well, 1.6 seconds, all right? That's, that's how long it would take, because that's how long it takes to go from 12 to 23 at that, with this particular tangential acceleration, which is a large one, right? The car's speeding up quite rapidly. So in less than two seconds, the car will begin to slip. It will, it, it's not going to slip up the embankment, because there isn't one. It's just going to slip out of the turn. It's going to start losing control on the flat road. Okay, in part B, we're asked through what angle of the turn has the car traveled before beginning to slip. Well, since we're given the radius, we can kind of find like the arc length, find the portion of the circumference of the circle that's covered. So we just kind of set, we just, first of all, just find the distance, 21 meters, and then we're going to use a ratio, basically that, zoom in a bit on this, so 360 degrees is to the circumference as some angle theta is to the distance that we found using kinematics. So we just then solve for that angle, and it is 9.9 .9 degrees. So again, not just a really kind of small fraction of the turn. I mean, not that we're told how long the turn is, but just a pretty small angle before it starts to slip. Because uh, I'd say the car is uh, speeding up too fast, right? Kind of an un uncontrollable uh, acceleration in this particular turn, right? At least considering it's an unbanked turn. Okay, so now our final example, a car with acceleration in a turn that has banking. All right, example 10. So I've already kind of, um, I already put in our views here. We have a top view, we have a side view, and we have a front view, okay? Why so many views? Well, the top view is gonna show the radius and kind of show some of the forces, all right? Um, it's gonna you know, show the arc, but the idea is that this particular turn, the, or in other words, the acceleration, because before we were just given an acceleration, in example nine, we we're just given the tangential acceleration. Here, the tangential acceleration is gonna be created from gravity, hence the side view. So in other words, this turn is changing elevation. So why not the elevation at the beginning of the turn, you can think of that at the peak of the banking, is not equal to y, the peak of the banking at the end of the turn. Furthermore, we need a front view because the turn is banked, as we can see kind of from this perspective top view, okay? And this is very much similar to the quiz. The only thing is in the quiz also includes the drag force, all right? And we'll talk about the drag force in lecture 15, which is the only other topic in this chapter. Okay, in chapter six. All right, so let's wrap this up, right? So we got a car, 1110 kilograms, enters a banked turn with a banking angle of 11.1 .1 degrees, that's that angle there, um, and a radius of 300 meters, that's that R, all right? The initial speed is 30 meters per second, that's that V right there, all right? The coefficient of static friction between the car's wheels and the pavement is mu S equals 0 0.0881, okay? So that would be um, the mu that creates that friction force. Notice that's a really tiny friction force. That, so that means we're gonna be worried about the car slipping down this way, which is why the friction force is shown to point up the embankment. The turn covers, covers a total of 100, 145 degrees. That's that angle right there, phi. The turn is uphill with a slope of 13 degrees. That's our angle alpha, okay? So notice we have an angle theta, the banking angle. We have a hill angle of, uh, of, of alpha, and then we have a turn arc of phi, okay? All right, keeping it all straight. So if the car's engine stop at the moment it enters the turn, and, um, oh, well, so it should say, uh, will the car begin to slip down the bank, the banked turn before exiting the turn at the top of the hill? Okay, so the question is, will the car slow down so much since it's going, while going uphill, that it eventually starts to slip down? Okay, well, let's see. So the first thing we need to do is find, using the forces, find the minimum velocity before slipping down banking occurs. So before we even consider the tangential acceleration that's being created from th that component of gravity, notice it's just FG10 that we're gonna worry about. FG normal does nothing, okay? Well, then before we even consider that, let's go ahead and first find the V min based on this diagram here. Okay, so we're just gonna set up F net X. That's gonna be this one here, okay? And then we're gonna set up F net Y. Notice since um, X and Y, neither of them deal with the tangential direction, we can have one of them be zero, all right? So that's good, all right? So then we're gonna actually use a really similar technique as we um, did for the problem with the engineer that was designing the road and solving for theta. In other words, we're gonna solve for Fn from both equations, from F net X and F net Y. All right, so that one's from Fx. And we're gonna do something really similar. 
from Fy. So we have two expressions for Fn. Set them equal to each other. All right, and solve for V min. And there it is, right? Nice expression for V min. And it's easier to solve for V min than it is for theta. I'll notice that I didn't have to do with all those final steps in order to isolate theta, right? But we got this nice square root expression. Okay, we can actually clean it up a little bit because the sine over um, sine theta over cosine theta right here that we factored out of both of them. Um, and again, I, you know, obviously skip some steps there. You can check them yourself. They become tangent theta, but I go ahead and plug in all the numbers with our banking angle of 11.1 .1 degrees. Okay, all right. And so we find that the minimum velocity is 17.7. So any slower than that and the car will actually slip down because this road is crazy slick. Okay, all right. So let's then go ahead and then now find out indeed how much acceleration in the tangential direction does the car experience? And does that mean that will it actually slow down to 17.7 from its initial starting velocity of 30.0 meters per second? Okay, initial starting, right, technical term. All right, so, and we see from the side view, okay, that AT is just FG tan over M. FG tan is just M sine, MG sine alpha, okay? So this is just a real um, simple free body diagram, right? And so that means that our tangential acceleration is negative g sine alpha, or in other words, negative 9.8 sine of 13 degrees, or negative 2.2 meters per second squared. That's the car decelerating in the tangential direction due to the fact that the, the, the hill is, is going up, that we're going uphill, and the car is just coasting, that's th slowing down, okay? And notice there's, there's, we didn't um, put any friction in the tangential direction, because we're assuming that the, uh, the wheels are, are rolling perfectly, more on that in a later chapter. But that, that is something we could vary, but we, we got enough on our plates right now. Okay, um, and velocity after the length of the curve is found um, from this familiar kinematic equation. All right, and our total arc length, our S for the entire turn is 759 meters. That's based on the radius and the fact that it's a 145 degree turn. All right, so we'll plug that in and solve for V final. All right, so we'll just plug that into our square root by you know, taking the square root of both sides. And we don't even get a real solution. Wait, what does that mean? Did I make a mistake? No, that just means that it, it does slip because the fact that there's no solution means that the car comes to, comes to a stop before he makes it to the turn. So not only do we slow down to 17.7 meters per second, sufficiently slow to slip down the embankment, the car actually comes to a complete rest. Well, it actually wouldn't. It would slow down to 17.7 and start to slip and then crash. But the point is it definitely slips and it doesn't make it around the turn. The hill was too steep, way too steep. I could have probably used better, uh, better values and maybe made it Less than, less than 13 degrees sleep. It's pretty steep for a hill, right? You could have made like three, three degrees maybe, right? But anyway, the idea is sound, hopefully it makes sense. And I hope this has been a, a good introduction to forces for circular motion, non-uniform and uniform. Thank you so much for watching the video.